If there had been international scientific openness instead of Cold War competition, this burnt-out space capsule might have taken three astronauts into orbit instead of to their graves. This is Apollo 1, where the Americans independently learned their lesson about the dangers of pure oxygen. The story of that tragedy began on a cold January morning in 1967, when three astronauts walked out to face the cameras before beginning tests on their new space capsule. They were Ed White, Roger Chaffee, and one of the heroes of the American space program, Gus Grissom. Do you ever think of the fact that you can get killed flying spacecraft? Well, we recognize that we can get killed flying spacecraft like we can get killed flying uh, T-33s or T-38s or, or driving my Corvette. Uh, it's just one of the facts of life for, uh, for everyone, but uh, we have a job that is uh, very fascinating and we're very interested in, and uh, it's worth the risk. Gus Grissom was first in line, it was said, for the moon. Instead, his wife Betty only has memories of a disaster. Well, he'd been told he was going to be the first one on the moon. And uh, he was pleased with that because that's what they all wanted to hear. And of course, that didn't make that one. It was just after noon on that terrible day when Grissom led Chaffee and White to the launch tower where the capsule was waiting. I was a 12-year-old boy who was a big fan of space flight, and for some reason I decided that Gus Grissom was my favorite astronaut. Once the men were inside, the capsule would be pressurized with pure oxygen, creating the same conditions as the Russian isolation chamber. This would be the last time anyone saw the three men alive. The day was already going badly. Communications between mission control and the capsule kept breaking down. At one point, Grissom made his famous remark about how are we going to talk to somebody on the moon if we can't talk between two or three buildings here at the Cape. There was great confusion on the intercom loops. I was listening to the test conductor. I was listening to the voice loop from the astronauts inside the spacecraft. Shortly thereafter, then, there was the call of something like fire in the spacecraft. I thought I heard some high-pitched voices. I thought I heard somebody say, uh, we're on fire. I thought I heard somebody say, get us out of here. I was fearful. Uh, I didn't know it was as much a holocaust as it was. The hatch was not designed to be opened quickly. It took five minutes. By then, all three astronauts were dead. Yeah, a power one fire for many people, especially for me when we heard about it, sort of brought the world to a stop. We knew riding on a rocket may have its moments, but uh, never did we believe that, uh, that we would lose three of our colleagues on the ground before they even got into space. The Apollo 1 fire was a tragedy that was, in the first case, preventable, and in the second case, should never even proceed to the point where it needed to be prevented. NASA was in shock and facing a barrage of criticism and wild speculation about what had happened. They launched an inquiry and soon made a horrifying discovery. Apollo 1, which everyone knew would have a pure oxygen atmosphere, had been packed with unprotected electrical cabling, surrounded by highly combustible materials. We had the whole damn thing full of Velcro because the astronauts wanted to be able to stick things to the walls, to the, to the console, to the everywhere, so it wouldn't be floating around. 
it traps all this oxygen in there and you hit that thing with a flame, it almost literally exploded. There's never been a full explanation of how the fire had been allowed to happen. But officially, the finger was pointed at managers who failed to manage and engineers who didn't think things through. the fault of the astronaut. Scott Carpenter, aboard Aurora 7 in 1962, became the second American in space. He was so entranced by the experience that he didn't want to come back. Imagine the greatest relaxation you can think of. That's what it is. The view from that altitude is transcending. Combination of both of those is uh, at least addictive. Carpenter's orbiting rapture meant he came close to running out of fuel and being lost in space. I wasn't happy with Scott Carpenter flying. I did everything that I thought was proper to uh, ask for him not to fly when I found that he was going to fly. Engine start. I lost that request. started out very well and ended up almost killing himself. He's got a black heart. Carpenter's mission was to carry out a series of experiments, but he was more interested in solving a beguiling mystery. On an earlier flight, astronaut John Glenn had reported seeing swarms of space fireflies. He saw sparkling particles out of the window. And he called them fireflies because we didn't have another name for them. There was even suspicion among some very bright people that there might be living creatures out there. But the fireflies, if they existed, were elusive. Carpets are kept looking and kept going. Fuel began to run short. My first inclination that we were not doing too well according to the flight plan was that he was using up too much fuel. And I tried to get the Capcoms around the world to say you're using too much fuel. So that really had me pissed off. Finally, after three orbits, an increasingly anxious craft ordered Carpenter to come back down. To do this, he needed all the fuel he had left. But just as he was about to begin his descent, he saw something. And here came all the fireflies past the window. And I realized at that time that they weren't living creatures. They were little uh, flakes of ice. busy beating on the side of the spacecraft looking at all the fireflies. I was having a marvelous time. I wasn't playing around. Carpenter was lucky to get down alive. With too little fuel left for a controlled descent, Aurora 7 came careering through the atmosphere and splashed down hundreds of miles off target. It was damn lucky. If he had gotten less velocity, he could have started in and burn up he could have not got in at all. And then he would have been stuck there. But Carpenter didn't mind. As the rescue fleet diverted to find him, he was still enjoying himself. I got in the life raft, and I 